Greetings and welcome to another episode of Sports Talk 101. From around the globe to Village Road, we bring you sports talk and culture from an Afrocentric perspective. Continuing on our Lyceum series in regards to baseball, we now will discuss its most important award, the Most Valuable Player Award. If you did not know, which most don't, the Most Valuable Player Award is named after the infamous Kennesaw Mountain Landis. Who is Kennesaw Mountain Landis? If you all know, back in the early 1900s, uh, the city of Chicago was uh, filled with uh, organized crime. That organized crime element seeped into its baseball. So when the White Sox were ruled, uh, she was Joe Jackson's team, were ruled ineligible, who stepped in? Kennesaw Mountain Landis. He was given this uh, uh, position due to his... Uh, work in law and he was able to quote unquote clean up baseball let's take a look at this man so we can greatly see who he is before we do that i would like to start with a quote this quote comes from mike schmidt mike schmidt is a three-time mvp and he was uh one of the philadelphia fly uh, excuse me uh phillies most important players mike schmidt said if you're looking to expose individuals in baseball history who promoted racism by continuing to close baseball's door to men of color, Kennesaw Mountain Landis will be a candidate. Barry Larkin, so, uh, Mookie Betts, Jimmy Rollins, Ryan Howard, Barry Bonds, Vlad Guerrero, Miguel Tejada, so many MVP winners of color, but yet they feel their award is stained when they get it from a known racist who clearly set the color lines in baseball. Remember, Jackie Robinson entered the league in 1947, three years after Landis died. So we must look at his role and his impact. With that being said, so many other things in the world are asked to be changed in regards to the social awakening that's going on. One of those is the Major League Baseball Award. Bringing in someone that's near and dear to me to explain this, uh, I would like to set him up. Uh, growing up uh, in, in my neck of the woods, it was about uh, just trying to get ahead. And I used to go, my mom used to take me to uh, one of her friend's house in a rental office court. And it used to be trophies lying from the bottom of the stairwell all the way up to the top. And I said, I'm gonna get some trophies like that. Now I didn't get as many trophies as this man, uh, who is truly a legend uh, due to his play in multiple sports, but also due to his philanthropic work, as well uh, as community involvement in the Western Pennsylvania and Pittsburgh area. So with that being said, I would like to announce the uh, proprietor of the Josh Gibson Foundation, uh, someone that I look up to, uh, like I said, my big uncle, uh, Sean Gibson. Hey, Sean, how you doing? Good morning. How you doing, man? Thanks for having me. All right. Great, great. So if you could just let the people know uh, uh, who you're uh, about your uh, foundation, uh, who it's uh, named after and its general purpose. Yeah. So as you mentioned, I'm the great grandson of Josh Gibson here. Uh, I run the Josh Gibson Foundation here in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. Uh, Josh is, you know, one of the greatest Negro League baseball players. I don't want to say Negro League baseball player, one of the greatest baseball players ever. Uh, played for two teams right here in Pittsburgh, the Homestead Grays and the Pittsburgh Crawfords. Uh, 1931 Homestead Grays was considered one of the greatest teams, as well as the 1935 Pittsburgh Crawford team was one of the greatest teams ever. They had five Hall of Famers on our team with Josh and Satchel Page leading the way. So, you know, it's an honor to be here tonight talking with you. Uh, as we know, you know, I've known you since you was a kid. You know, you, you're like family. Your mom and mom were best friends. So, I uh, appreciate you having me on. I'm looking forward to this conversation tonight. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. So now, um, as we all know, it's the 100th anniversary of Negro League Baseball. Can you talk about uh, Josh Gibson and the Negro League's impact on this 100-year anniversary, and particularly in regards to overall style of play, culture that's permeated Major League Baseball since the Negro League's disbanded? Well, you mentioned this is the 100th anniversary. Um, Nicholas was founded February 13th, 1920, to be exact. And due to COVID, um, a lot of things has been postponed. 
due to COVID-19. Um, as we all know, uh, this past week on August 16th, Major League Baseball celebrated the new release with everybody from Major League Baseball to the coaches, to the umpires, but wearing a patch that represent the new release 100 anniversary. So, um, you know, since that, you know, this is based out of Chicago, I definitely want to mention uh, Rue Foster. You know, Rue Foster is the founder and the creator of the Negro Leagues. And he also played, he was a pitcher for the Chicago American Giants. So if it wasn't for Rue Foster, there may not have been a Josh Gibson or Satchel Page, or even a Buck Leonard. So praise the Lord to Rue Foster. Um, I feel as though he doesn't get enough credit due to what he has done for the Negro Leagues. And, you know, I'm happy that he's able to be able to represent it very well. So um, as we move forward, as you mentioned, um, you know, some great players came in the Negro Leagues. I mean, you got Josh and Satch, uh, who are probably two prominent players in the Negro Leagues that people talk about. You know, Satchel Page was the first Negro League baseball player inducted to the Hall of Fame in 1971. And Josh Gibson was the year after in 1972. Uh, unfortunately, as we all know, Josh died very young. He died the same year Jackie Robinson broke the color bread in 1947. So he never had a chance to see Jackie Robinson playing the majors. He never had to see none of his other counterparts in Negro Leagues playing the majors. Um, you know, he brought, he died of a brain tumor um, at 35 years old. So, you know, Josh been dead well over, you know, almost 80 years now, 70 years. And here we are still talking about his legacy through the work that we're doing through the Josh Gibson Foundation. Thank you. Uh, I'm glad you glad brought, you brought up Ruth him. Foster because we detailed him in our very first episode. I would like you to just touch on the greatness of these players. A lot of people don't know uh, the dynamics of uh, baseball stadiums. So now these parks, they have short porches in regards to a right field, whereas uh, Josh Gibson and many of the Negro League stars were playing in the polo grounds. Uh, epic Forge Fields, these large stadiums where they still were smashing uh, dingers and homers all out. Can you please speak to the greatness and the skill of these players in these vast stadiums that they played in? Yeah, you mentioned, I mean, you know, especially with Josh, I mean, he was a home run hitter. You know, you had a guy named Neil Suttle who's a home run hitter. Um, you know, Turkey Stearns was a home run hitter. But, you know, you talk about some of these uh, stadiums, as you mentioned, you know, um, you look at Josh Gibson you know, everybody called Yankee Stadium the house Bay Ruth built. But Josh Gibson is known for hitting the ball out of Yankee Stadium. Um, now, I'll set the story set the story straight. The ball did not go out of Yankee Stadium, but the ball did hit the top tier in Yankee Stadium. So it's still the furthest ball ever hit in Yankee Stadium. And we all know how big that stadium was. As you mentioned, Forest Field. Um, you know, Josh Gibson hit a home run over out of Forest Field. If anybody familiar with Pittsburgh, Forest Field is in an area called Oakland, where actually the University of Pittsburgh is located at. So there's a story that Josh Gibson hit a home run out of the Forest Field, and it went into one of the classrooms. Um, so this home run greatness was phenomenal. But then you talk about some of the position players like Cool Papa Bell. You know, he's one of the fastest baseball players ever. There's a story about him. He ran so, you know, he was so fast that he can be in the bed before the lights get, when you shut the lights off before it gets dark, he's already in the bed with the covers on him. So, you know, we know some of these stories are mythical, but they just tell you the talent of these players. Uh, Satchel Page, you know, they, the story with Satch, you know, he was batting against Josh and he told all the players in the outfield to sit down. And the story is told that he struck Josh out. So, you know, there's, there's, there's many stories of the Negro League players um, they all were great. You know, these guys played the game because they loved the game of baseball. They weren't getting, they, you know, they, they didn't play for the money. They, you know, they get, they made decent money for that era, but they just loved the game of baseball. And I always tell people that, you know, Josh and the rest of those guys would have loved to play in the majors. But as you mentioned earlier in your story, there was a guy, there was a guy named Kennesaw Landis who stopped all that. Could you give us some more insight on Kennesaw Landis and his actual dealings? as you are a true historian of Negro League Baseball and what he actually did, not only in Chicago, but throughout the country to enforce this color line. Uh, again, in the previous show, we covered uh, uh, Fleetwood and how you know the Chicago Cubs went to Toledo and said he couldn't play, and that's when the color line enacted. But could you just give us in uh, some more visual detail the nature of Kennesaw Landis? 
Yeah, as you mentioned, you know, Kennesaw Landis, you know, he was a judge. You know, he's a law enforcement. He was a judge. And as you mentioned, there was a scandal going around with baseball, do with gambling. And at the time, they wanted to clean baseball up. And they thought, I don't know why, but they thought a judge <laughs> uh, with his background would be the type of guy that would clean baseball up. And, you know, he was a, in the 1920s. He was he was the uh, commissioner. And we all know um, he did not let he did not integrate baseball. As you mentioned, Fleetwood Walker was playing baseball and he stopped and they, they, they got him out of baseball. And then when Kennesaw came, the commissioner, all the great players that we just talked about, Satch, Josh, Cooper Bell, Buck Leonard and the rest of those guys, Kennesaw Landis um, denied them the opportunity to play baseball. Now, of course, you know, he didn't. He never, of course, he never admitted that he didn't have them because of the race. But we all know what the story is about. Um, and it's sad because those guys in that era miss a lot of great baseball. And that's why when people talk about Babe Ruth's the greatest or Ty Cobb's the greatest or Joe DiMaggio's the greatest, how can you say they're the greatest when they didn't play against black baseball players? And like you said, you know, people always say Josh Gibson is the black Babe Ruth, but no, Babe Ruth was the white Josh Gibson. And so when you talk about Kennesaw Landis, I mean, he just basically destroyed baseball at that time in that era with some great talent. I mean, you look at Pittsburgh, for instance. The Pittsburgh Pirates were terrible in that in that in that era. And here we are with two great Negro League baseball teams right here in Pittsburgh, the Grays and the Crawfords. If the Pirates would have just took a couple of those players from the Grays and a couple of players from the Crawfords, it'd have been a dynasty. But you know, at that time, Kennesaw Landis. Um, and I and you know the thing that said for to get a little history on this, it wasn't that he enforced it, but I think some of the, the owners didn't challenge him, you know what I mean, into a branch, you know, then challenging. And so I think that's the most sad part about it, that these, some of these teams could have challenged him and went on to sign a black baseball player before Jackie Robinson crossed the color barrier. So that's kind of a, a quick synopsis of, of, of um, Kennesaw Landis. But as we all know, uh, he did not let African-Americans play baseball in the early 1920s and 30s and 40s. Thank you. So again, having the support of uh, so many MVP winners, including uh, Barry Larkin, who says this award needs to be changed. Can you please tell the listening audience why the award needs to be changed and why it should be called the Josh Gibson Award? Well, several reasons. Um, you know, as we're going on today, you see what's happening today in this world. You see what's going on with Black Lives Matter. You see what just happened today, you know, First time in a long time in history that there's no basketball today. You know, it's finally boycotting basketball today. Um, and I guess we, as as, as African Americans, athletes or non athletes, we're getting tired of this senseless killings of our people. You know, men and women, black and you know, you know men and women um, getting killed. So, Kennesaw Landis, um, the reason why the Josh Gibson, like you mentioned, Barry Larkin, Mike Smith, some of the white players as well, and some of the black players, um, due to the movement, decided that, you know, why should we have someone who's a known racist who didn't integrate baseball, names still should be on this award. And so I stumbled on a, uh, a story that the same one you read from an AP writer that mentioned about certain players wanted his name removed. And names they would like to see on that trophy was Frank Robinson, um, not Jackie, Frank Robinson, who's the only only player to win the MVP in the American League and the National League. And he's a first black coach manager, uh, Branch Rickey. We all know his story. He uh, integrated baseball with Jackie Robinson. Then, of course, Josh Gibson. And so. I didn't know nothing about that until I read that article. So when I read that article, you know, I went to my board of directors and my family. I'm like, look, we need to capitalize on this and see how we can get to get a movement to see, you know, we can get Josh's name on this MVP trophy. And so, you know, we reached out to Manfrey, who's the commissioner of Major League Baseball now. And he got right back to us and said that, um, they have no control over the naming of the award. It goes through the Baseball Writers Association. So he told us to call, contact a guy named Jack O'Connell, which our people did. Of course, he never got back to us. We reached out to him twice. I told our people, look, we're not going to keep reaching out to him. He's going to ignore us. 
So I have a, you know, it's good to be, it's good to have your last name, Gibson. <laughs> so I reached out to a few people that I know at ESPN um, and they love my idea and they put me in touch with a young lady at the undefeated. And she asked me to write my story of why I think Josh should be the MVP. And we wrote our story and our, and our story um, is based off of, of a redemption, kind of a poetic, poetic justice type story. Um, I'm going to give it a whole rundown, but it's kind of based off of, you know, a, here, here it is that the name on the MVP trophy right now is a guy who's stopped a lot of African-Americans from playing baseball. How ironic would it be for one of those guys he denied to replace him with the name that one of the players he denied? So, um, you know, ESPN, I was, a, I was great for undefeated to putting it out. there. got a lot of feedback. Of course we got some negative feedback from, you know, who, um, and saying it should be named after Babe Ruth or it should be named after this person and that person. Okay. Um, Josh didn't play the majors. And I'm like, read the story, man. We know he didn't play the majors. Read the story. Read the reason behind why we think it should be named after Josh. Um, so, you know, the list goes on, man. But it, right now, as far as the MVP, we have a big push right now. Um, the Baseball Writers Association meets in December, whether they meet in person or um, virtual. This will be up for discussion at that time. And hopefully, you know, with us doing interviews like this, we have a petition out right now on change.org. Just type in Josh Gibson. And hopefully um, we'll, we'll let the public know and the writers know that based off this petition, based off the articles, based off the, 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 what, the what the community wants and what the, what the city wants, uh, especially here in Pittsburgh, to rename it after Josh. So that's our push. Uh, well, I know Josh is loved in Pittsburgh and throughout Western Pennsylvania, DC as well, um, due to the uh, uh, Grays playing in DC. Uh, what can uh, listeners outside of Western PA, uh, the Sports Zone, Chicago family and its affiliates, what can we do to bolster this flame and get Josh's name on the MVP award? Yeah, good point. One, sign the petition. Um, it's on our website as well, joshkitchen.org. Also, too, I mean, if you know any local writers, um, you know, in your area that would like to interview me about why we sh why we think the name should rename. I mean, why we should think the war should rename after Josh Gibson. I would love to do an interview, um, have this article, have it in the paper. Uh, if there's any other radio stations uh, that want to talk to me about uh, why I think it should be renamed after Josh, I'm available. You know, that's that's what my goal is right now. I'm, I'm promoting Josh and MVP from now until December. So if anybody's listening. You know, anybody want to interview me, whether it's print, radio, Zoom, I'm available. All right. Thank you so much. So, again, listeners, we have already established the correlation between Pittsburgh and Chicago in regards to Negro League Baseball. Before moving on to our next segment, i just like to make a quick point. Uh, Sean stated that uh, uh, people always say that Josh and other stars didn't play in the major leagues. That may be true, but the all-star game that they had at that time, which was toward the end of the year, the Negro leagues repeatedly beat the major league all-stars. Um, uh, another thing that uh, is not credited to the Negro leagues is again, the style of play before Negro league players uh, came into baseball. It was just try to hit a home run, a uh, small ball, uh, stealing, even wearing your, uh, your pants up to show your stirrups are all signs of uh, the Negro League mark on Major League Baseball. So if you could just talk about that, Sean, for a brief second before we move into our next segment. Yeah. Well, as you mentioned, and actually the uh, All-Star game was played in Chicago, the Kaminsky Park. Mm -hmm. So and it drew a lot of fans there. I mean, I was like a big deal for the uh, Negro Leagues. And, and let me just say this, you know, when people talk about the Negro League, there's a lot of white fans there too. So it wasn't just black fans. You know, white folks came out to see great. You know, I think at the time, white folks wanted to see good baseball. So they came out to Comiskey Park for the East-West All-Star Game and came out and support the African-American players just as well. But as you mentioned, you know, um, baseball, African-American baseball, the Negro Leagues, you know, they, they, they started with the light, the night games. The first night game was in Kansas City. Kansas City Monarchs, um, Wilkinson was their owner, a white, he was the only white owner. Um, it was Effa Manley, who was also white, but she passed for black. She was a female owner for the Newark Eagles. Jill Wilkinson was the white owner for the Kansas City Monarchs. Now, Effa is the only, she's, a, she's in the Hall of Fame as well, Effa Manley. But um, 
Jail Wilkinson had a night game. You know what I mean? And then Gus Greenley here in Pittsburgh had a night game. So they were for they were they were definitely before their time. When we talk about the style of play, uh, we had a team called the Indianapolis Clowns. Um, that's who Hank Aaron started off with at first. And they were more like the Harlem Globetrotters. I mean, they were, they were a professional team, but they like the Globetrotters. So they did a lot of stunts and with the ball and tricks with the ball and things like that. Um, so the Nickel League, I mean, the talent was was phenomenal. Um, as you mentioned, as far as the style as well as their uniforms, you know, I can think off the top of my head right now, you know, if you ever see some of the African-American baseball player players who may wear their pants up to their knees, that's – showing respect to the Negro Leagues. And one of the guys, another Chicago guy, is Curtis Granderson. He used to wear his pants like that. And he always stated he wore his pants to represent the Negro League baseball. And so, you know, some of the players, I met Ryan Howard. Uh, he didn't wear his pants up, but he always showed tribute to the Negro League baseball, Negro League players as well. So, um, yeah, so some of the Major League Baseball players right now, um, you know, on October 16th, we have some customized made Josh Gibson wristbands and several African-American players uh, throughout MLB. Um, just to name a few, uh, Matt Kemp, um, Delano DeShields, uh, Josh Bell, uh, Andrew McCutcheon, and a couple of players from the Seattle Mariners uh, wore our wristbands. So, you know, I think with the movement going on, now they have the Player Alliance through Major League Baseball, it seems that they're more – um, getting into Negro League baseball and understand and understand the importance of the history of Negro League baseball. Thank you, thank you. Um, now let's talk about your foundation. If you could just give us a brief synopsis of the Josh Gibson Foundation, its purpose, mission, and any programs that you're enacting now. Yeah, so as I mentioned earlier, so Josh Gibson Foundation, of course, is named after Josh. We're located here in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. We actually have three locations. Um, we're in two of the Pittsburgh public schools and we're in one center. One of our uh, sites is at the community center in the Hill District of Parks and Recs. That site actually is the site where Josh Gibson's field is at. So where Josh Gibson started playing baseball, he started playing Sandlot baseball with the Pittsburgh Crawfords. And so that field at the time was called Ammon Field. Uh, since then in 2008, uh, we renamed it, it was renamed through the city council of Pittsburgh, Josh Gibson Field. Um, beautiful field, two fields with uh, dugouts, and our kids actually, through our foundation, uh, did some murals of Negro League baseball players inside of our dugouts. Um, you know, one, I always say this, one of the most famous, besides our celebrity softball games that we had there, but one of our most famous baseball players that play on our field is Monet Davis. Um, hope, I'm pretty sure most of us have heard of Monet Davis. If not, Monet Davis is the young lady out of Philadelphia, Pennsylvania, who was the pitcher who played in the Little League World Series. Um, and her team, which is the Anderson Monarchs, uh, her coach, Steve, is a good friend of mine. They came down and had an exhibition game against us, actually twice here in Pittsburgh. So, um, but yeah, so, you know, the, the thing we're trying to do with the Josh Gibson Foundation is mainly just get these kids off the street, man, especially with what now with everything is going on. As you mentioned, um, you know, the goal of the foundation is just really uplift these youth and make sure they get an education and not only their education through the foundation, but also to further their education. Um, our programs, we go from, we have a STEAM program and people say, why do you have STEAM instead of STEM? Well, we added the arts piece and because of there was an opera based off of Josh Gibson's life called The Summer King. Uh, so Summer King was produced by a guy named Dan Sonnenberg. And in 2017, it was the first ever world premiere opera here in Pittsburgh. The Pittsburgh Opera has been around for 80 years, and they never had a world premiere opera. And it was on an African-American. So that was a blessing for us. We went to Detroit in 2018. And right now we was trying to get it in Kansas City uh, for 2020 due to the uh, centennial. But due to COVID, things was on hold. So we have our mentoring program um, at Langley School, uh, Boys and Men Mentoring Program. We also do, we have a curriculum in the schools called BOSA. Now, BOSA stands for Business of Sports Academy, and it's a sports curriculum that teaches kids the business side of sports. And, you know, we wanted to focus on, you know, some of our kids and athletes want to focus on being a professional athlete. 
which we tell them we're not give up your don't give up your dream of being that professional athlete, but it's also can also be successful behind the scenes and still be involved in sports. Uh, so that's those that, that's that curriculum consists of sports media, sports marketing, sports sales, sports events, and sports law. And we're looking to add in um, um, health. I mean, um, um, training, physical phys- physical trainer into that into that curriculum. So. Um, you know, those are some of the programs. We also have a Josh Gibson Youth Academy. Um, that's ages 9 through 12. Last year, we played in D.C., and we played the Washington Homestead Grays. The first time was the Grays versus the Grays that we had a team like that. So, you know, our goal is just trying to get these kids off the street, not only off the street, get some history, uh, represent the name of Josh Gibson, represent the Negro Leagues, and let them know that, um, you know, we're here for them. What events are you doing now in the centennial year? Are you doing anything special? You know, we're not because of COVID. We did do something with the Pittsburgh Pirates pitcher, Keon Akella, uh, this past Saturday. But all of our events has been postponed. So we will have our Josh Gibson Youth Classic where we bring in teams from other cities that represent the Negro League teams. So all the teams that come in. So, for instance, if Chicago came in, there'll be Chicago American Giants. If Kansas City comes in, it'll be Kansas City March. So all these young young men will be wearing Negro League uniforms. Um, so that, that's push, that's postponed until next year. Our Josh Gibson Gala, which is our main signature event, our main fundraiser, has been postponed. Um, with that event, we give us something called the Josh Gibson Legacy Award. Our past recipients have been from former Major League Baseball players, uh, from Lou Brock to Juan Marshall, Reggie Jackson, Barry Bonds, um, the Clemente family, and the list goes on. So and then we also was going to do a symposium with national speakers, and the topic was going to be, what does the Negro Leagues mean to you? So all those events have been postponed to uh, 2021 due to COVID. So hopefully uh, we don't get that second wave as they're talking about we can have these events next year. Great, great. So everyone hear that in the Sports Zone Chicago family, let's get this series going between Chicago and Pittsburgh. Let's uh, make Rube and uh, Josh Spirits uh, sing, sing with praise. Um, you mentioned uh, in regards to uh, the young men playing baseball. Growing up, I had examples of Mike Diaz, uh, Barry Bonds, Bobby Bonilla. So my generation seems to be the last generation that went out there and actually played baseball, you know, a lot. Can you speak to the lack of participation in baseball in our community? Yeah, this is a lack. Like you said, that's a great word because, I mean, I would say in Pittsburgh, if some of the warmer states – um, the warmer climate, like Florida down south, because they can play baseball year round, it may be more popular to play baseball. Uh, but I'm just speaking as far as Pittsburgh. Uh, yeah, baseball has has been dying here for a while. Um, we used to have about 12 teams in our league. Now we're down to about six. Um, and, you know, it's just sad because um, baseball is a great sport. and Your money is guaranteed. But most of the kids are playing football. Um, being here in Pittsburgh, I mean, look, the Chicago White Sox just got a no hitter last night against the Pirates. The first no hitter of the year, and the pitcher's first first hit. And the pitcher was not the same thing about the Chicago White Sox, but the pitcher was even that great. So our baseball team has not been that great in a long time. You get rid of one of the best players, not one of the best, one of the best and popular players, Andrew McCutcheon, got rid of him. So, you know, I think our kids, you know, before what four or five years ago when they had that three year run of going to the wild card before that, they was, they lost 20 years in a row. So if you were, if you were 22 years old or 23, you never saw the winning team in Pittsburgh. So it, it's just hard for us to get baseball going because I think on a professional level, they don't see it in the winning team here in, in football. You got a black head coach. The football team is always competitive every year. We might not go to the Super Bowl or playoff, but we're always competitive. And it's a lot of kids are gravitating to uh, that sport. So, you know, but baseball, you know, our goal is to bring baseball back. That's why we have these classics. And, you know, we bring in teams from out of state. The kids want to play against other teams from out of state. So hopefully, you know, us starting these classics will get more kids interested in playing baseball here in Pittsburgh. Yeah, I hope so. Uh, It still makes me sick to my stomach. Uh, I see that uh, Francisco Cabrera. Uh, hit, Sid, bring, slide, man. Uh, thought we was going to the World Series, but uh, a lot of people probably don't even remember that event. Um, I got it. I'm not. I hate to do this, man, but my, I got. I got to plug in my my uh, charger. 
All right, no problem, no problem. All right, so again, uh, Josh Gibson Foundation, we are trying to get this uh, spread like wildfire. Please sign this petition through Sports Zone Chicago and its affiliates to get the Kennesaw Mountain Nun its name changed. Um, again, when we look at baseball, uh, Sean just talked about participation. So let's let's use another parallel: um, college sports. Uh, college football does a lot of classics in regards with uh, not only HBCUs but uh, schools from different conferences to increase their game. So uh, we're definitely going to talk about um, perceived baseball classics or potential baseball classics uh, that, you know, we would like to set up through the Josh Gibson Foundation, Sports Zone Chicago, and its affiliates, so that way we can get more exposure to baseball. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to chime in a little bit here because Sean said something and I couldn't resist it. I couldn't resist kind of adding into this because today on Sean and Maya, we had this conversation about the no hitter with Giolito. Now I'm a White Sox fan. Everybody who knows me knows that. And one of the things that I said, and of course people got all over me because pitching is my thing. Like I watch pitching all over the league. And I said, don't get me wrong. I'm not taking away from what Giolito did. I mean, it's not easier. It's not easy to get a no hitter. I said, but real talk. It isn't like Pittsburgh was that great. I'm not trying to be mean, John, but I'm glad you said that because of the, I said that to somebody, I said, but I know like you got to be who's in front of you. I said, but let's be honest. They're really not that good. I'm like, I'm more impressed if you pull that feet off against, you know, when you face the Cubs. The, the, well, no, they handled the Cubs actually, but yeah, he didn't pitch in that series, but like the twins, the twins are like leading the division. You know what I mean? Um, if you go in and, and, and get and pitch against a team like that, that has hitters, then I'm absolutely like, this is amazing. But it was hard for me to like get really excited about that. I mean, I'm not taking it away from them, but I said the same thing. And people told me I was being a negative Nancy FYI. You're right. Because somebody, somebody also said they're surprised that they didn't get a no hitter before that. So somebody didn't get a no hitter against them before that, but yeah, no, you, you can say that. I mean, it is what it is. We only got seven wins, so. <laughs> well, that's And that's exactly my thing, is that we're not talking about a team that's impossible. Um, I was like, Dallas Keiko might pull it off today, but then he, like, first pitch hit and it was done um, with Cole Tucker. So I was like, oh, well, that's done. But, yeah, I'm glad you said that. So I just had to jump in so to kind of validate my point because people gave me a really hard time because I'm a White Sox fan. I'm like, I'm just being honest. Giolito is only an ace because there's nobody better on our team right now. Right. But when you get the Dunnings, the Kopecks, when these better pitchers come up, we'll see if we're still having this same conversation about Giolito. Okay. I'm going back. To my, I'm going back to my producing. Job. Right, well, <laughs> I hope they don't move into a middle reliever, but uh, so Sean, <laughs> we, we were talking about our participation and I gave reference and do these uh, HBCU classics. They have for football, the Bayou classic celebration bowl, where they get two large HBCUs from different conferences uh, play in a professional stadium. to draw awareness, not only to their schools, but the sport. Um, could you talk about any interest the Josh Gibson Foundation has in setting these up for baseball and having baseball uh, celebration balls, per se, or classics? Yeah, we would love to. Uh, anybody listening that has any HBCU connection, um, the Josh Gibson Foundation, the Josh Gibson name, would love to partner with HBCUs and, and do a Negroly Classic, Josh Gibson Negroly Classic, where we bring all the HBCU players together and host them somewhere in Atlanta or wherever it may be down south somewhere and do an all-star game, you know, where all the players will wear Negro League uniforms. Um, they can wear different uniforms from the Monarchs to the Chicago American Giants to the Black Yankees to the uh, Cuban Giants and, and, and so on. So I think it could be a nice event. I think it would be a, an exciting event to see all these uh, young professional or athletes that may be professional sometime wearing – um, you go to uniforms, you know, give out awards. You can have a home run derby. That could be the Josh Gibson Award. Uh, we can do, you know, some other some other skilled awards and name up the players. So, yeah, we would love to do that, man. I think that's 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 going. I know baseball is a dying sport in some of the HBCU schools as well. But, you know, for the schools that still got baseball at HBCU, please reach out to me. Let's talk. We would love to do something uh, around the Negro Leagues. All right, so uh, athletic directors, uh, Dr. Inglewicker McCree, uh, JT, 
Um, all you powerful athletic directors in the MEAC and the SWAC, uh, listen to uh, what this man is saying. We're trying to set some things up. Um, I don't know if you know this, uh, uh, Sean, but the SWAC, uh, the conference with Grambling, Southern, those schools like that, they just became a super conference, not only in baseball, but in football as well with the addition of Bethune, Cookman, and Florida A&M. So I think that conference along with the MEAC will be great places to start and getting the uh, Josh Gibson Foundation's min, uh, mission out and hopefully setting up a classic. Hey, let's make it happen. We would love to talk to those uh, two conferences and see what we can do. I mean, we have a lot of connection with the Negro League players and families. We can bring them involved in it. And and I think, I think it's just good overall, you know, something nice to do. You know, we got two historical organizations, HBCU and the Negro Leagues. Um, why not? And not only that, though, several um, Negro League players went to HBCU schools. So, there we have it. I mean, we talking about you talking about the Washington Homestead Grays. Talk about in D.C. Some of you may may or may not know um, at Howard University they have a hospital. Howard University Hospital sits on the site of the Washington Centers where they played their games at, and that's where the Homestead Grays played at. So there's a lot of history in D.C. around the Grays as well. So we do have some HBCU connections through the Negro League. So we would love it. It'd, it'd be a perfect fit to get two historical organizations together. To celebrate a great cause in our sports and baseball. Well, thank you, thank you so much. Um, before we close, if you could just give us uh, some last impressions of what you think current Major League Baseball is doing. Uh, again, on our last show, we made reference to uh, a player being uh, told to apologize for hitting the grand slam on the 3-0 pitch, showing enthusiasm, uh, showing a similar style to play to that of Negro League players which a lot of players of Dominican descent do. Can you kind of talk on the game now and how it's trying to kind of diffuse that spirit? And that's the spirit that's needed, not only to revitalize the game, but to bring in players of African descent. Well, getting back to that home run, I think my thing is this, is that, if that you know, I, I can't speak, but if that was a white player, who knows what they would have been said. You know, it's always sometimes when it's a, a person of color, it's always that something bad. I mean, my thing is, you know, I play basketball. And it's called patting, patting your stats. If you know if you're beating the team by 30, he's on the game. You want to get fouled, get some extra points. Hey, you get a home run, man. Home runs a home run, and I don't think he should apologize for that. This is professional baseball. They get paid a lot of money. The pitcher should have struck him out. I mean, simple as that. You know, um, he didn't. So that that's first and foremost. As far as Major League Baseball. Uh, what I would like to say this, I feel like I think Major League Baseball can do more for small uh, foundations like the Josh Gibson Foundation. Uh, Satchel Page has her own foundation. Uh, Buck Leonard has her own foundation. You know, they give all you know, they support the Negro League Baseball Museum um, heavily. And the Negro League Baseball Museum doesn't support none of the family members uh, in any kind of way, whether it's financially or promoting or anything. So. Um, that's first and foremost with Major League Baseball. Um, but other than that, like I just said, they just did the August 16th um, Centennial Tribute to uh, Negro Leagues by wearing a patch. Um, you know, some of the teams, you know, um, I, I watched the Philadelphia and the Mets game. They had some of the, you know, a lot of those teams were doing a cutout cardboard fans. And the Phillies had a whole bunch of their fans um, as Negro League Baseball players, which I thought was great. I wish more teams would have done that, being that it was that day. Um, of course, Pittsburgh did not play that day because uh, one of the players from Cincinnati uh, came down with COVID. So their uh, weekend series were actually canceled, and Pittsburgh is celebrating theirs on this Friday. So I have an interview with them on Friday during – because this Friday, the 28th, is actually Jackie Robinson Day for Major League Baseball. So, you know, so Major League Baseball, you know, you know, I can, I can say they're doing their part, you know, um, they can really do their part if they help, you know, even they don't have any say so, but I'm pretty sure they have some influence on that award. They can really do some justice if they help get this award down to Josh Gibson. Definitely. So our last question um, in regards to these quote unquote unwritten rules of baseball, could you kind of speak on the racial uh, undertones and connotations that they imply and why uh, that along with, uh, Kennesaw's name should be taken out of baseball altogether. 
Yeah, there's no, so I mean, there's unwritten rule. You know, I mean, my whole thing with that is that um, the players have spoken. You know, what I mean, there's a big movement going on, and and, and, and and you know, every day is something different. I mean, the movement started with George Floyd, then the young lady Brianna, Brianna got killed, and then the guy who got killed by the two white guys jogging. It just seems like every day we turn the news on some innocent African-American is being killed. And today was a big stand um, with the NBA and out at WNBA, NBA. And I think I saw something with the Seattle Mariners postponed their game. Milwaukee Brewers canceled their game. Major League Soccer as well. Major League, there you go. So, you know, people are looking for a change. I mean, they're taking away statues of, of dictators and, and former generals and, and things like that. And so when we look at when we look at the we look at the history of racism and where we are today. I mean, like I talk about this all the time, like here we are celebrating 100 years of Negro League baseball. Right. And we all know what they went through. They never played in the majors. And we are still talking about the same thing a hundred years now. I know my grandfather will probably would never imagine that his great grandson would be going through some of the same things that he went through as a young man. And it's a hundred years later that we're still talking about this. And, and, and hopefully, it, hopefully for my kids and grandkids, it won't be another hundred years later. You know. So, uh, due to what I'm saying is that. With all this uh, movement with Black Lives Matter, this, the, the, the racism, the social injustice, and you know, Kennesaw Land is falling right in with that. And so, when they're making these changes with these statues and monuments of of, 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 of slave guys or people who supported slavery and and, and racism, well, then his name got to go too. Now, whether if it's Josh or or Frank or whoever it may be. It should definitely go. But, you know, we're going to shoot for Josh Gibson. So, you know, that, that's the way we look at it. Thank you so much. So, again, Sports Zone Chicago, we have here Sean Gibson, great grandson of Josh Gibson, executive director of the Josh Gibson Foundation. Um, if you can give us any closing words um, for our listening audience. Again, uh, our goal is to promote uh, baseball and all sports. Uh, baseball for this show in our community and get an overall awareness of our historical presence in that sport. Um, so if you could just leave us with some uh, parting words in regards to um, how we need to get back into baseball, it would be greatly appreciated. One thing I want to say too is that, you know, let's get this, since we're doing the baseball topic and we're talking about history and we're talking about um, civil rights and things like that, let's bring it, let's talk about Jackie Robinson for a second. And I always bring this up. So we all know Jackie Robinson broke the color barrier in 1947, right? And I think what people don't realize is that how much pressure Jackie had on him um, as being the first. I mean, basically, he had the whole African-American community on his shoulders. But one thing people don't think about is that just say if Jackie would have failed, right? Say if Branch Rookie would have brought him up and he would have been a bust. He would have he failed. People don't realize how long it would. Now we're talking about 1947. You people don't realize how long it, it probably would have taken Major League Baseball or another owner to take a chance on another black player. It might have been another 10 years or so. And so, I just like to point that out is that how significant the role Jackie Robinson played, not just in baseball. We all know he was involved in civil rights. I mean, and we're, like I said, you, you want to tie it into the day and the same guys like LeBron James and all these other guys that are speaking out for the African-Americans. Jackie Robinson did this. Um, Bill Russell did it. Of course, Muhammad Ali did it. You know, uh, uh, Jim Brown did it. So it's, it's, it's great that to see these guys, you know, as well, stepping up to the plate because it has to be a change. And, you know, like I was saying before, is that that change is going to start with Josh Gibson's name on that MVP award and, you know, leave it at that. All right, again, so again, thank you so much for your time. I greatly appreciate that. Um, again, I will be one of your liaisons 
as I am a current uh, HBCU uh, football coach, I will use my uh, connections to help uh, improve your foundation here at Livingstone College, where I work at now. We have a sport management program with uh, open enrollment. Um, so if you had any students that want to get a bachelor's degree in sports management, I can service them personally right now. Uh, thank you so much for your time. I greatly appreciate not only this, but the mentorship throughout the years. And again, I wish nothing to the best to your foundation and all your business efforts. I appreciate it, man. I appreciate you having me on here. And for the listeners, any, any information about the Josh Gibson Foundation, go to our website, which is www.joshgibson.org. Right, again, there you have it. Uh, Sean Gibson, everyone, uh, proprietor of the Josh Gibson Foundation, Sports Zone Chicago, Troubadours. Uh, what's up, cuz? All the affiliates, let's get together and sign this petition to get this name changed. Thank you for listening once again to Sports 101, an Afrocentric sports talk show that covers topics from around the globe to Village Road, and we will see you all next week. Thank you, everyone. Have a good evening.